Here we go, chapter seven, aquatic ecosystems. We don't call them biomes. Biomes are reserved for the terrestrial ecosystems and they're very large geographic regions. When we talk about water, we just talk about aquatic ecosystems. Very, very simply, we're gonna have freshwater ecosystems and saltwater ecosystems. We just talk about them in terms of salinity. Today, I'm gonna to talk about terms that apply to both. I'm gonna talk about plankton, nectin, and benthos, and then we're gonna go specifically into freshwater. With no further ado, here we are, your essential question. What are the littoral zone and the benthic zones that make up a lake or pond? Something to think about as we move through today. Once again, freshwater ecosystems, these are just determined by the water's salinity, freshwater versus saltwater. Freshwater ecosystems are gonna include ponds, lakes, streams, rivers, and wetland. Now when we say ponds, lake, they're really the same thing. <laughs> a lake is just bigger than a pond, and we talk about rivers, streams, once again, the same thing. It's just a stream is smaller than a river. There's no really classic definition of it. It's just small pond, large lake, small stream, large river. Wetlands, specifically. Now we've talked about wetlands to a degree, but remember, these are areas that are periodically under water. They don't have to be underwater all the time, but at least part of the year, completely underwater. So that takes up what they are. Let's address some terms that apply to all of these, and they will also apply to our saltwater ecosystems as well. There are four big factors for aquatic systems. These are temperature, sunlight, oxygen, and nutrients. These determine which organisms can live in which particular area of the water. Everything needs these four to some degree. Some have, need to have very high oxygen, some can deal with low oxygen. Some need a lot of light, some can deal with no light. But those factors determine what we're gonna find and where, and a lot of times, how much. Several types of organisms also tend to be grouped by their location, where we tend to find them, and by their adaptation, what they're able to do. So let's look at some of these. We're gonna start off the first one with what they're able to do. And the first term we're gonna talk about is plankton. No, not plankton from SpongeBob, sort of, but not really. They're actually much smaller than they depict them. Plankton are actually this. They are mostly microscopic organisms. We saw plankton when we looked at life in a drop of water, little teeny tiny green or swimming things. So they float or drift freely in the water. They can be the microscopic animals, zooplankton, or they can be the microscopic plants like algae, the phytoplankton. But the main thing with them is that they can't swim against a current, they're drifters. They can swim up, they can swim down, a little bit side to side, but in a current, the current carries them where they're going. So it's not that they're incapable of swimming, but they can't swim against a current. A little bit of movement up and down, side to side, that's about it. The second one we're gonna talk about is nectin. Free swimmers. These things can't, and then we talk about it in the pelagic zone, but in, anyway, just out in the actual water. Trout, they can swim against the current. Salmon, minnows, fish of virtually any kind. It's also going to include things like squid, can swim against it, turtles, you name it. As long as it can swim independent of the currents, it can go against it or with it, depending on what it wants to do. We refer to these as nectin. Lastly, we're going to talk about benthos. Benthos are the bottom dwellers, like Patrick the starfish. Well, instead of Patrick the starfish, let's look at this guy, a real starfish. Yeah, these are benthos, bottom dwelling, either on the sea or lake, doesn't matter. And a lot of times these guys will be attached to hard surfaces, like a clam or a barnacle. So we get a lot of things that are down there. And we also, benthos, we talk about the decomposers, and other aquatic organisms, maybe uh, insect larvae or worms, anything that we find on or in 
the bottom of the pond, lake, or ocean. So we have plankton, drifters, necton, swimmers, benthos, crawlers. And some of them are actually can't crawl, they're attached. These things right on the bottom. So that's true of everything, whether it's freshwater or saltwater. Now let's talk specifically about some freshwater systems. Lakes and ponds. Once again, same thing, it's just a matter of size. But because of the size, we sometimes get some little differences. Now lakes, ponds, wetlands, these can form naturally anywhere that the groundwater reaches the Earth's surface. Also, you and I, humans, will intentionally create artificial lakes. Whether we dam up a river, I've known some people that had farmland where they had a little creek running through and they dug it out so they could have a pond in their farm. But anyway, <clears throat> they can be natural, can be man-made. Lakes and ponds also can be structured into horizontal, the horizon, horizontal, and vertical zones. And the types of organisms present in these zones depends on, by and large, the amount of sunlight. Now, all four are important. Sunlight, temperature, nutrients, and oxygen. And we find different levels of all of these things in some of these different zones. And you want to kind of think through, as we talk about them, what would I find there? Because it's going to determine what sort of organisms we have. The first one is this, is the littoral zone. The littoral zone. I'm going to kind of keep this picture up here as we talk about some and you can look at them. The littoral zone is going to be right in the shallow area. This is where the sunlight reaches the bottom. Here we have a lot of aquatic plants. Because it's reaching the bottom, they can grow and hang onto the mud or rocks, depending on the type of bottom on a lake. So their upper leaves will typically come out of the water, so like lily pads, reeds, grasses we find here, and we'll then in open water, we'll tend to get some algae and bacteria coming in that can undergo photosynthesis. Remember, some types of bacteria can undergo photosynthesis. Most are just decomposers, but we do have some species that do. Now, some of these bodies of lake have areas so deep that the water doesn't reach it. There's very little light for photosynthesis. So bacteria we find in these deep areas, the fish that happen to be adapted to cooler, darker water, uh, perch or one of these, they'll go down where it's deep and they may come up to feed. And eventually we get our dead decaying organisms that reach the benthic zone where we find these dense boats. So, as we look at the picture back here, the, we have this photic zone, the area that has light. But right near the shore, we have a special name, the littoral zone. It's photic, but it's reaching the bottom. The photic zone out here, it reaches so far, but down here it's pitch black. There's no light reaches it. And that's our benthic zone. Uh, it talks over there, again, this profundal, because the benthic zone, remember, is just right on the bottom. So below the photic zone, but before we actually hit the benthic zone, which is just right on the bottom, is this profundal no light zone. So we get these different areas. Light reaches the shore, light reaches down for a while. Then we have the profundal zone until we get to the benthic zone. And the benthic zone would still also be at the littoral, the bottom, the whole way. So kind of keep those in mind as we talk about things, because there's obviously some overlap between them. Now, life in a lake. Animals that have there, they have adaptions so they can attain what they need, like water beetles. You see this water beetle, they get this little silvery sheen. What they're doing, they have little teeny tiny hairs and it traps the air. Now, beetles don't breathe like you and me. They just have spiracles, they have little holes in their body, and as they move, they take the oxygen in. So this trapped oxygen allows them to breathe underwater, to thrive for periods of time. Also, there are places where lakes partially free. The amphibians tend to burrow down into the mud and they hibernate, kind of like out in the desert where they estivated, but here it's cold, they're hibernating. My favorite one is the gator. When it gets too cold, they can sense it, and they come and they stick their nose right out of 
the water and they let the pond freeze around them and they just kind of chill in a hibernation state till it melts so they can breathe anyway. Pretty cool adaption, but all of them have to deal with it. And one of the terms we're going to talk about, we have the light, the oxygen, etc., is nutrients. Now everything needs nutrients, but as my mom would like to say, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And this is what eutrophication is. Too many nutrients like nitrates or phosphates make their way into an aquatic ecosystem. A lot of times it's because of runoff from over fertilizing, but it can be natural, can be man-made. But these excess nutrients come in, allow the plants and the algae to grow too much, which brings the bacteria in to feed on the algae and the plants. The bacteria then take all the oxygen, or most of the oxygen, out of the water, and not enough oxygen, the fish begin to die. Everything needs sunlight, nutrients, oxygen, and temperature. Too many nutrients, creates too many plants, brings in the bacteria, and they take out the oxygen. So eutrophication, we talk about things like algal blooms or red tide. This is what is causing it, too many nutrients. A lake that has large amounts of plant growth is what we call a eutrophic lake. We have oleogarchic lake. They tend to be really clear, usually rocky edges, and an oleogarchic lake can become a eutrophied lake or a eutrophic lake. Usually this happens over a long period of time, but once again, it can be accelerated from runoff when rain is carrying sewage, fertilizers, or animal waste. A friend of mine has a farm and all the cows out on it poop, and then when it rains, the rain carries the nutrients to the lowest level where the pond is, and he has a eutropho uh, eutrophic pond that's because of natural causes. He's not using fertilizers, I and mean, somebody near him might, but mainly it's a natural cause from the animal waste. There can be lots of reasons for a eutrophic lake to form. But this takes us to wetlands. Remember, underwater part of the year. They don't have to be that way all the time. We're going to talk about two types, and you need to know the difference. They are marshes and swamps. Here's the basic difference. Marsh contain non-woody plants. In other words, it's all green stems and stalks. Uh, lily pads, weeds, all green stuff. You look around, it's all green stuff. This is a marsh. All little low-lying green stuff. A swamp, however, has woody plants, dominated by woody plants. When you look around, you see wood, right, like sticks. It could be mangrove swamps, it could be bush and brushes, and it can be full on trees, but it's woody types of stems. You look in this area, even in a swamp, you're going to find some green stuff like grasses and lily pads, but you see a lot of woody stemmed plants. If so, it's not a marsh, it's a swamp. Make sure you can identify the different ones. Most of our wetlands in the United States are found in the southeastern United States, with the largest one being, yeah, the Everglades, right here in Florida. So if we take a look at this map, we saw all from North Carolina down into Texas, this whole southeast region has a lot of wetlands. The largest continual wetland is us down in Florida, the Everglades. A lot of these look big, but a lot of them aren't really interconnected if you get down and look close. The only other year we have them is really some up around the Great Lakes, way up in the north, but not very many. Once again, most of them cluster down here in the southeast of the United States. Now, wetlands act like filters or sponges. They suck up nutrients from the water. So we get runoff, whatever, it's coming down, makes its way to the wetlands. They tend to have, even if it's a swamp, they still tend to have a lot of little green, weedy type plants. These things are taking up the water and the nutrients and the pollutants. Whatever's in the water, they're pulling in and they're pulling it out of the water into the plant. If the plant dies a little quicker, well, they're weeds and reeds. They tend to reproduce pretty quickly. So they pull pollutants out of the water, giving us an incredible um, ecological service of clearing, cleaning out our waters. They can control flooding. They're the low-lying areas, so when we get a lot of rain, it naturally goes there, keeping it out of our business areas, our neighborhoods, etc. 
and they also provide home to a lot of native and migratory wildlife where they come in to feed on all the little spawning frogs and fish, game fish, you name it. Loads and loads of life throughout these wetlands. Now when we talk about the wetlands, let's talk about marshes specifically. Remember, marshes, mainly green, weedy types of plants. These tend to be on very low, flat lands that have very little water movement, very slow water movement. The plants themselves root down into the very rich bottom sediments, and the leaves stick out above this and get the water year round. So, you know, the leaves are always out, but part of them might be underwater. Once again, some time of the year, there may be almost no water there. It's just kind of muddy and mucky. We talk about different types of marshlands. We talk about in terms of salinity. We have just freshwater marshlands. It's all fresh water all the time. We have brackish. We find these near the coastline. It's where the ocean comes up sometimes or up the rivers and it's brackish. Somewhat salty, somewhat fresh and other are just plain old saltwater marshes. And we'll address them a little more in detail in the next section. Now the benthic zones, remember, benthic is just the bottom. It could still be part of littoral, and in marshes it is. It's not deep enough to have a dark zone. So, but the benthic zone, just the bottom, very nutrient rich, contains a lot of plants, and because of that there's also a lot of decomposers and scavengers. We get waterfowl by the millions coming here. Ducks trying to sift it to get insects, herons stabbing fish with their spear-like beaks, etc. And the marshes are attracting things from everywhere, like our classic Canadian geese coming down. They're migrating from the temperate down into the tropical, uh, once again, looking for food by and large. This takes us to swamps. There's a swamp. Once again, flat, poorly drained land. But a lot of times swamps are near streams, so the water can be faster moving. And this is also why we find a swamp instead of a marsh. It kind of clears things out if it's moving too much. We find a lot of water-loving trees, our cypress trees. Right here is Cypress Swamp. We find these all over Florida, Georgia, the surrounding areas. These are ideal habitats for amphibians because of the continuous moisture. Birds get attracted into these hollow trees for nesting, etc. But reptiles are the predators of the swamp, like our friend the alligator back here, eating almost anything that comes across their path. Not that it's only alligators, but lots of other reptiles we find there as well. Now, human impact on the wetlands. When I grew up, my dad would say, yeah, if you believe that, somebody's gonna sell you swamp land in Florida. And I grew up thinking Florida was nothing but a horrible wasteland. And that was the idea of wetlands. They were just mosquito infested, horrible areas that we needed to drain or clear up so we could do something decent with them. Well, we've learned our lesson. We did that in a lot of places and then we wound up having a lot more flooding. The water going into the ocean was dirtier and polluted. We realized the wetlands actually do a lot and they're protected by federal laws now and most states prohibit the destruction of wetlands. Anything over three acres in size winds up being protected. Smaller than three acres they can just be filled in by a development company but we've come a long way in realizing that our wetlands are actually very important. So the swamps sort of sedges us into rivers because Swamps tend to be normally along streams, river areas, so our rivers. Now rivers tend to follow a particular set or path. So I'm going to throw this picture up and we'll talk about it from the headwaters down. If we just take a classic river system, it starts up in the mountains. The raining in the mountains, it trickles down and begins to form a stream. Several streams will come together to form a river. Well, up in the upper regions, the water is moving very fast. It's not real deep usually. It's trickling over water so it's cold. It's getting churned and bubbled over a lot. Very highly oxygenated. Cold water can also hold more oxygen. And it's getting bubbled and churned. Really high oxygen content. But it does tend to be cold and not quite as much nutrients. Some are washing off into it, but it's in the headwaters, not as arid. So it dictates what can live there. But we do find trout and minnows because they like this really highly oxygenated water. 
Now as it comes down the mountain, it begins to typically broaden. Once again, more streams are pouring into it. The river tends to broaden up. It gets a little bit warmer, not high up in the mountains. It's a little warmer here. It tends to get a little wider and a little slower, but because it's getting warmer and a little slower, less oxygen content. So we're going to find things like bass and brim and other sort of game fish, typically. Then it changes on with the land and, and the climate for which it flows through. Typically, as it gets closer and closer to the ocean, it tends to get warmer and warmer. As it gets warmer, a little less oxygen, we find some different organisms, more like catfish. So once again, up at the headwaters, we tend to get mosses and lichen will attach themselves. We call these things rhizoids, the root structure that allows them to hold on to this fast stuff. We talked about the minnows and the trout who like it. Downstream, we tend to get more plankton. The drifters begin to come in. More light is getting in. It's not moving so fast. So the plankton and algae come in. Things come in to feed on them and etc. And we get way on down to the south, more like here in Florida, where you get close, warmer, very slow moving. And we find things like catfish and carp in a lot of these areas. Dangers to rivers. Industry use river water a lot of time in the manufacturing process or using it to cool off some sort of thing within their tank. And it's also been used for waste traditionally a lot. So you see, we just had areas where we dumped waste directly into the rivers. And we've used them just to dispose of sewage and garbage. Now in the United States, we've gotten a lot better with putting laws on that. The water has to be treated before it can be returned back into a river. But not everywhere in the world is doing the same thing as we do in America. It costs money as well. But typically, sewers, I mean, rivers have been used just as sewage dumps. And they've polluted the rivers with toxins and killing a lot of the river organisms and made the fish inedible. Even the fish that are there, they might survive, but if you and I eat them, we get biomagnification. That poison moves up the food chain as we eat multiple fish. So it becomes very bad to do it. And a lot of times just run off from pesticides. Once again, I'm spraying my lawn, so I cut down on bugs, it rains, those pesticides make it into the stream, and then it's killing off things in the water, or the fish are eating things that have the pesticides in them. And it can coat them and make them bad. And once again, main troubles to the rivers tends to be you and me, but most of it tends to come in the form of either actual dumping in the rivers or in the forms of runoff with fertilizers and pesticides making their way in, which really isn't good for anybody. That wraps it up for our freshwater ecosystems. Join me next time when we look at the marine ecosystems. Take care, guys.